Hello everyone, uh, it's Mr. Ashby and we're going to be looking at Federal Stint Power, briefly chapter 6 for today's lecture. Uh, in American history, this takes uh, from 1787, basically the signing of the Constitution, all the way through 1801, which signifies the um, peaceful transfers of power between the Federalist Adams and the Democrat Republican Jefferson. This revolution of 1800, it is called. Um, so let's get started. In this early time, Washington basically uh, is elected as our first unanimous president. Uh, he will serve two terms, and then Adams will come in as a one-term president after him. These 12 years are dominated by Federalists, both in the White House and in Congress. Uh, part of this whole time period is also dominated by federal, Federalist policies is Alexander Hamilton's role in this new government as well. Uh, he is not a president. He was never really um, even into the voting politics, never been voted into the national government in, in any place. But because he was so dominant with his economic policies and his economic policies won out in America, uh, he is will and forever will be remembered as one of our founders of our economic livelihood and policies in America. Uh, he was a brilliant young lawyer. Uh, he was part of the, the Constitutional Convention. He wrote the Federalist Papers. Um, after that, he was uh, elected, not elected, but appointed by Washington as the first Secretary of Treasury. And he had a very Federalist ideology. He believed in the light and ruling class. He believed that the state and the federal government should assume state debts. He wanted a strong central government. And he favored the British uh, in this it's sort of a um, connection with trade and mercantilism. Early on in our American history, um, part of the Constitution was to create a judicial branch. And part of the judicial branch was going to be creating a high court. Well, they didn't actually lay that out directly in the Constitution. So early on, Congress passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, which will officially set up the Supreme Court in the American politics, and John Jay will become its first Chief Justice. Okay, so Hamilton's three-part economic plan. It was going to be very controversial, and it was going to have a lot of debate within these first Congresses. Um, so Hamilton's three-part plan, the first part is going to be assume state debts, create a national bank, and then pay off the national debt. So again, let's get started with assuming the debt. Okay, so during the Revolutionary War, um, many states will, and uh, the federal government will go into extreme debt. Well, the first part of the plan was to deal with the currency issue. So during the Revolutionary War, Congress printed huge amounts of currency, this continental currency, this continental dollar. And this currency had basically, you know, basically dropped in value and there's the a huge amount of inflation with this where this currency was almost worthless. It was worth pennies on the dollars. And so what Hamilton wanted to do is he wanted to basically assume this, this, this currency at face value. He wanted to repay each note at face value. And the reason he wanted to do that, he wanted to, one, he wanted to increase the government credit, so it means he wanted to make sure that that currency and that basically when America prints money or takes out loans, that 100% of the time that currency or loan will be solid and be stable. So he wanted to make sure that that was, that was cemented in stone, that, that very strong American currency. Um, it also would create a permanent national debt, which he actually thought is a, a small national debt, is a, is a blessing to a country. We'll get to that in a little bit later. The second part of the plan was to assume all the state debts. So basically meaning every single state that had debt from Revolutionary War, the federal government was going to take that at, this, at, at their own. So this was sort of uneven, though, because some states had already paid back that debt. Um, and so there was a lot of debate about this war. Was this fair for all the states? The reason why he wanted to do that, he wanted to, again, to make sure that no one state fell sort of victim to the overall war as a whole in America. Also, he thought that if a wealthy elite would loan U.S. money, then they would actually have a stake in the survival and the, uh, 
uh, of the United States and keeping it together. Okay, the second part of his plan was creation of the National Bank. And this was gonna be extremely, extremely debatable. The reason for the National Bank, he said, that it would provide loans to merchants, handle government funds, and issue financial notes. Um, also, it would stabilize the interest rates in smaller banks, making sure smaller banks don't over uh, capital themselves, means they don't you know, give out or loan out too much money than they have available in their bank. Um, so he really wanted to make sure that the banking and the industry was extremely stable. Because again, typically what banks will do and help, they will help out more the manufacturing or industrial side of the economy. And again, Hamilton was all about manufacturing, industrialization, and mercantilism. So he wanted this bank to be sort of a, um, a um, I can't really think of the word, but he wanted this bank to be a, uh, this bedrock of this new American economy based on industrialization and manufacturing. Um, and that's, this bank's gonna be really heavily helping those sectors of our economy way more than would help the agrarian or the farmer of the planter class. And of course, paying off this national debt was going to be a chore as well. So what he instituted uh, or issued was the report on manufacturing. In this report, it, it basically um, had to go into the details of what we need to do to be able to raise money to pay off our debt. Um, and so two ways to do this. The, the biggest way was taxes. We, he, we need to increase our taxation for, for this. Um, the best ways to do this are two types of taxes, internal taxes and external. Well, the external taxes were normal. I mean, that, those were ones that we've already been paying. And what he did, he basically increased those external taxes. Well, that is gonna have a direct positive effect on those Northeastern manufacturing areas because it's gonna basically make it so British and French and other European goods come in at a much higher price, basically protecting the American-made goods. So we call these protective tariffs because again, they protect the American-made goods that are very similar to what's being taxed. The second type of tax is a much more debatable tax. Uh, this tax are internal taxes and uh, they're basically taxes on goods made in America. What he proposed was a whiskey tax, basically a tax on all American-made whiskey. And that's going to be very controversial as well, which we'll get to in a couple slides. Okay, so now debating his program. Um, one of the huge debaters or the huge proponents of this plan was actually James Madison. Um, and it's sort of ironic because James Madison and Alexander Hamilton were both you know, co-writers of the Constitution and the Federalist Paper. They had a lot of agreeances on things. But as time went on, James Madison will actually start becoming less like Hamilton and more like uh, Thomas Jefferson. And so the big issue of the assumption of debts uh, of these Connell currency was that the thought of this Virginian, James Madison, was that many people in Congress would profit from this because they knew that these uh, dollars were almost worthless. And they knew if the government paid them off at face value, they could make huge gains. So a lot of the congressmen who actually went out and bought these continental currencies, the, the, these continental dollars, and eventually will sell them and get their money back from them at huge profit. So this was very debatable in that aspect. Here's one example. For example, the merchant of the firm of Burl and Burl had paid about $600 for Confederate notes with a face value of 2,500. Their redemption at face value would bring them an enormous profit of $1,900. This was a lot of money at this time period. Uh, Patrick Henry, a quote that he had on this increased national debt that we were gonna create by doing this. To erect and concentrate a perpetuate, a large moneyed interest must prove fatal to the existence of American liberty. Basically saying that if we create a debt, we are going to be basically um, at the mercy of whoever we're in debt to. 
Also another debate is going to be how do we look at the Constitution? The Constitution was just written and it was going to be very new. And how do we look at it and how do we use it is going to be a very debatable way. There's two types of power in the Constitution that we sort of agreed upon as powers that, that are given to the government. Well, one of them is enumerated powers. These are powers that are directly stated in the Constitution. These are powers that literally you can find a line, you can find the words, you can find the, the article that states what the government can or can't do. People who believe in these are strict constructionalists. These are people that believe that only what's in the Constitution should be allowed to be used and governed and used for the creation of laws and orders. And the people who believe in that were the Democratic Republicans, these, these uh, uh, Jeffersonians, these Madisons. The other idea to look at the Constitution is, yes, there is enumerated powers in the Constitution, but as well as those, there's also implied powers which means that these are powers that aren't directly stated. These are not actually line items or words you can find. These are items that are implied by other things that are actually in the Constitution. Uh, so that means that it gives them the government, the people in charge that will be using this Constitution, the leeway to stretch or to basically look at the Constitution loosely and sort of meld the Constitution to the time that they're in. Uh, this, uh, and this is also, um, there's a statement in the Constitution called the Elastic Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. Basically saying that there are things that the, that the government will have to do that are necessary and proper. Um, and basically that if the Constitution allows one thing, that will, it may mean that there may be another thing that, that has to be done to make that one thing work. And this is a, a very Hamiltonian way, or a Federalist way, of looking at the Constitution. The big debated thing was the creation of the U.S. Bank. Hamilton created this U.S. Bank to basically um, help deal with the, the taxes, the debt, the payments, and also promoting an economic manufacturing industrial interest in America. Um, the problem was is that there was nowhere in the Constitution that stated a bank could be created. So there's going to be a lot of different issues where is using implied powers a correct and an okay or constitutional thing to do to create this bank? Jefferson is going to say, basically, or the, basically Hamilton will say, the bank would assist in the government's collection of taxes and pay its debts and therefore clearly fell within the compass of national authority. And of course, Jefferson was really pissed off and eventually he'll actually resign over these issues. And paying off the national debt was going to be a priority will. Again, it's going to be very debated because the types of ways to pay it off is going to be taxes, especially these internal taxes to the Western farmers who had to make their grain into whiskey to make sure that it would not spoil before they could get to market. So they believe that the Western farmers in America, in the Kentucky and Pennsylvania and places like that, are carrying a bigger burden of the American tax structure than the other people. Okay, these are all these plans. To get these plans through Congress, there had to be much debate and much compromise. And one of the biggest compromises that was made to get these plans in Congress was where should we put the Capitol? The Capitol was in New York City, and the thought was, well, the Southerners wanted to, to be in more of a Southern location. So to get them to pass off Hamilton's plans, the Federals had to give the South the capital. And so they, uh, they carved out some land between Maryland and Virginia, and they, decide, they decided that they're going to move the, the new capital to this little piece of land and call it Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. And at the time, the capital was just a small little sleepy, you know, um, you know, swampy village on the banks of the Potomac River. Okay, um, in the next election, Washington will, will win unanimously again. He's the only president to basically get two unanimous votes. And as Washington starts taking his second term, we're going to see the formation of new political parties. 
uh, to combat the Federalist hold on the government. So we're going to see our first two-party system that creates a new opposition party to sort of oppose the Federalist growing power. Um, and actually, James Madison warned us about this in Federalist 10. The public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties. Um, but again, they thought that the Federalists had overstepped their bounds, and now we needed to have a rival party to sort of contest some of the Federalist uh, ideology or political thoughts. And the Democratic Republicans are going to be the party or that opposition party to oppose the Federalist rule. So here's some things to look at. It's really good to understand each side's sort of ideologies. So Federalists, uh, Hamilton, Washington, Jay, Adams, Marshall, for example, um, wanted an economy based off of industry, commerce, and manufacturing. Uh, they wanted to have a government that had the power of the federal government over states. Uh, most of the supporters were wealthy or the Northeast. Uh, they believed that, the, that you can use implied power, so they were loose constructionalists in the Constitution. And, and they believed that a bank was necessary, not just desirable, but actually needed. And because they were based off of trade, they did sort of favor the, uh, the, the British when it comes to um, foreign alliances. The Democratic Republicans are going to be led by Madison and Jefferson. Uh, they believed in a very utopian, agrarian ideology based on agriculture. And they wanted to have a limited federal government with more power than the state governments. Uh, their supporters were Southerners and Westerners and yeoman farmers. Um, and they, they, were, they looked at the Constitution very strictly, only wanting to use enumerated powers. Uh, they thought a, a bank could be nice but was not necessary, just desirable. And in the conflicts of uh, world power, they typically sympathize more with the French than they did with the British. And Jefferson was going to be this very enlightened thinker, this, this, um, this Renaissance man, you could say. Um, and he had a vision for American. He wanted America to be educated farmers, yeoman farmers, that had a direct hand in our democracy and voting. Um, Okay, one of the things that did come up early on in Washington's presidency was the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, goods and bads about this. One, it showed that America had a lot of internal turmoil in America. Um, we weren't just this one united, happy country. Uh, there was a class division, and this showed it, that the people of the West were, felt that they were being sort of picked on by these taxes, and they felt they paid too much of a burden on the taxes. And they rebelled. They basically uh, you know, refused to pay the taxes and sort of like, you know, gathered up people to sort of march into the city to rebel against that. Well, here's where the Constitution worked. Washington was able to raise an army and then march into western Pennsylvania to subdue and suppress the rebels. Well, remember just a few years earlier in Shays' Rebellion, the federal government was not able to do that, and the militia of Massachusetts had to basically uh, take the role on that one. So it shows the Constitution would work. Jefferson was actually against this. He said basically, a little rebellion every once in a while is good for the country. Um, so um, again, different side and different viewpoints on this. In the same time period, we also see the French having their own revolution. Uh, in this time period, you know, the French were wanting American alliances, and Washington was very much not for it. Uh, he wanted to stay out of these foreign entanglements and Jefferson, the Republicans, thought that by not aligning ourselves with the, with the French, it was a betrayal of them because they had allied themselves with us during the Revolutionary War. Okay, so obviously during this time period also we see the English and the French starting to go to war against each other. And both of these countries want America as their ally. Well, Washington states that we are going to be allies with nobody and claim neutrality so we can, we, we can legally trade with both sides. To convince Washington otherwise, the French sent over an ambassador, citizen Edmund Gannett, and instead of going directly to Washington, you know, the, the, you know, the person, with basically a plea for alliance, 
Gannett basically goes into South Carolina and the South to try to rile up Democrat Republican support of a alliance with French in this time period before he goes up to visit Washington. Washington was furious about this and actually will expel him, um, but he actually gets married to an American Southerner, so he's not able to be expelled. It just shows that the French really had very little respect for our new system of government and our new head of government, President Washington. The issues with the British were just as bad. Um, the British basically wanted to convince us to side with them, so they took a different tactic. They actually started to something called impress, um, basically take American sailors off American ships and force them into the British Navy. They would also basically stop American ships and seize American goods off these ships as well, so basically harassing us on the open seas. So to deal with this, we send an ambassador over to England, John Jay, to deal with a treaty or deal, to make a treaty to sort of soften the, the economic blow by all these seizures and the, this impressment by the British. Um, he comes back with a treaty, but a very weak one. Uh, one, he doesn't really address the issues at large, well, again, the impressment. Um, also, um, he doesn't really do enough. So he's looked, So when he comes back, uh, many people actually sort of villainize Jay as a traitor, as un-American, as pro-British, you see there. A more successful pe tr uh, treaty was, uh, was uh, Pinckney's Treaty, which was signed between Spain and America. And what this treaty was, basically, we needed to have navigable rights in the Mississippi. Uh, which means that the mouth of the Mississippi was in New Orleans, which was owned by the Spanish. So we basically brokered a deal with the Spanish stating that we need access to the Mississippi River. For that access, we will give up all of our claims to this area, um, basically in Florida. We'll give up our Florida claims. We'll still hold on to these claims, we're going to give up our Florida claims. Okay, starting with the downfall of the Federalist Party. Um, basically, in the election of 1796, we see John Adams run against um, Thomas Jefferson. And the reason why Washington doesn't run, because he thinks that, that basically that the president should be a temporary position, not a pseudo-monarchy. So by him stepping down and not running, he's saying a lot about the role of that position, the president, in the American government that's not going to become this sort of habitual, long-term person that basically rules over our country. Very close election. Um, Jefferson will lose the election. Adams will win. And in this time period, basically, the loser of the election gets to be the vice president. And this was going to be tricky because now we have a vice president who is a Democratic Republican and a president who's a Federalist. You see, very close election. Uh, Jefferson pretty much wins the West and the South, where Adams dominates the Northeast and the New England states and the coastal areas of these states as well. Washington, in his farewell address, he will warn against two different things. One, political parties, he, or factions, he calls them. The other one, of foreign entanglements, which is foreign alliances. So he warns against that. Um, in his final passage before he steps down as president. Um, speaking of foreign policies, one of the big things that was going on in the first years of Adams was that the French were now starting to harass the Americans just like the British were. And so um, basically they were trying to capture American soldiers, uh, you know, uh, seize American goods, just disrupt our supply lines and our, and our uh, merchants going across the ocean. So what we do, we send over an ambassador to talk with the, the French you know, trade representative here. And the French refuse to even hear our ambassador's um, plea without taking a bribe. And we refuse to pay the bribe. When, when Adams finds out about that, he labels the diplomats as XYZ diplomats of the French. So it's called the XYZ affair because of that. And what Adams does, he basically decides to make a navy, create a navy, and basically harass the French merchant vessels just like they harass ours. 
So we don't officially go to war, but this is sort of like this quasi war, this like war between us and the French, but not an official war. We actually don't start any type of fighting, just sort of harassing on our open ships on the open seas. And you see the three diplomats, or the three diplomats right there. And then, you know, basically, you know, us you know, pleading, pleading with them, you know, basically not being respected. Okay, so with the French and us having tensions, and with the Democratic Republicans uh, starting to become more powerful and wanting more sort of political wants in this country, um, Jefferson, I'm oh, no, sorry, Adams does something that historically is not a very good idea. He gets really paranoid about his government and basically the downfall of his government. He gets really paranoid about um, the newspaper editors speaking badly about it. He gets really upset about foreigners coming in instead of basically joining with the Federalist Party, joining with the Democratic Republican Party. So he passes these sets of legislation called the, the Alien and Sedition Act, very controversial. The Alien Act created obstacles for foreigners to wish to become citizens and allowed the president to deport anyone that seemed dangerous. So very, very vague about who, who's like basically um, the enemy here. And again, the key was, was to basically make sure that these new immigrants that was coming over wouldn't be active Democrat Republican voters. The Sedition Act prohibited publication of malice attacks on the president and Congress. Basically, it forbid the newspaper from speaking or writing negative things about the Federalist Party. And what's going to happen is that the Federalists are going to basically jail several Democratic Republican editors because of this, a true violation of First Amendment rights. Uh, so bad that both Madison and Jefferson are going to write the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions to go against this. And basically what they're going to do is they're going to bring in this concept of nullification. That since the states created the Constitution, they also have the right to basically nullify anything they deem unconstitutional that is created by the Constitution. Uh, so they basically said, you know, we're going to refuse to abide by these rules and these laws that you just created. And it will set precedent because we'll have several other states eventually throughout our history also try to nullify congressional law. Okay, the Revolution of 1800. Uh, in this very, very close election, Adams will basically lose the election and Jefferson um, will win. Very close and actually comes into a runoff uh, where Jefferson and Burr tie. And there's a big issue behind that because back then, you had to vote for two people, not one. Again, it's not like that anymore, but it created a tie. And the tie went to the House of Representatives where Jefferson will be elected, our first opposition party being elected um, in the, the country's history. And that's why this is called a revolution, for two reasons. One, it signifies that America was wanting to shift our political ideology from a Federalist to a Democratic Republican ideology. Second reason why it's called the revolution is that this is going to be the first peaceful transfer of power from one political party to a different political party. So he'll win this election. And then right before, right before Adams leaves office, uh, he's going to push Congress to pass the Judiciary Act of 1801. This act is going to create brand new judgeships that he will be able to appoint Federalist judges. The thoughts were that since Federalists lost both the presidency, the executive branch, and the legislative branch, that they could put in Federalist judges into the judicial branch to keep the, the party's power at least in one of the three branches. And these were called midnight appointments. In the next chapter, we're going to see this very, very famous Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison, on how um, this will be uh, dealt with in this new Jefferson administration. Okay, that's our lecture. You guys have a great afternoon, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow in class. Bye, all.